fit, formidable, and fantastic. Hey everyone, it's Corey McCarthy and welcome to a new episode. So here we are again with another installment of the best vegan bodybuilding foods. Uh, this is the fourth in the series, in fact. You all seem to be enjoying these, so I'm going to keep them coming. And this one's going to be fucking epic, an informational powerhouse. I am very excited to bring this one to you. This episode covers one of my personal favorites, and I consume a fuckload of this in one form or another. Soy. In fact, I consume so many soy products that I think I deserve a sponsorship from a brand or something. <coughs> Wildwood. <coughs> you listening? Now, in my case, the vast majority of the soy intake... Uh, of my soy intake comes from extra firm tofu or soy isolates that are in my protein powder blend. In fact, some days I've consumed upwards to 30 ounces of tofu. But you can also consume soy beans themselves, or you can buy other soy products like tempeh. Uh, now, before we get too deep into this topic, I need to uh, fucking crush a very common bullshit myth regarding soy foods, their isoflavones, and male hormones. In a comprehensive meta-analysis of the results from 51 different groups of men, soy protein and isoflavone intake demonstrated no negative effects on testosterone, sex hormone binding globulin, free testosterone, or free androgen index. Furthermore, isoflavones have demonstrated no effect on sperm concentration, count, or motility, and led to no observable changes in testicular or ejaculate volume. So seriously, people, stop perpetuating vicious rumors that unfairly demonize this nutritious food. Soy is not going to give men the jiggly tits of Ulysses Jr. And this also demonstrates how horrendously wrong the Weston A. Price Foundation is, and how guilty they are for peddling misinformation about dietary choices. As if you'd need any further evidence beyond just looking at the quality of health that their co-founder Sally Fallon embodies. Compared to, say, 70-year-old vegan Annette Larkins. Any questions? In fact, soy can offer positive hormonal benefits, which makes it a perfect candidate for this video series. It has been demonstrated in research to significantly raise your growth hormone levels. More specifically, this increase occurred when soy was ingested alone or with either higher carbs or higher fat, but not with both carbs and fat. The highest growth hormone increase was witnessed when soy was ingested alone. That being said, it was only a 7% difference between the solo soy group uh, versus the group with soy and carbs. Um, however, when soy was consumed with both carbs and fat, the growth hormone was 40 to 44% lower. And the growth hormone increases are likely due to the arginine content of soy. The takeaway? If you're going to have soy meal um, and you want to reap the growth hormone benefits, consume some soy on its own or have it with either a carby food or a fatty food, but not both. For instance, you could do a meal containing just tofu or tofu and rice, or oil sautéed tofu and avocado, just to give you some examples of what I mean by, um, by pairing there. It should also be noted that there are benefits of soy isolate protein powder on male hormones. By the end of a 12-week study on resistance-trained subjects consuming 50 grams of soy isolate per day, there was a nearly 26% increase in total testosterone, a nearly 33% increase in free testosterone, and a nearly 18% decrease in estrogen levels. There was also a 2% increase in lean body mass. Which is why I consume a soy isolate inclusive protein powder blend. Um, people have asked me about the protein powder blends that I consume. Well, I got something special for you. If you sign up for my business mailing list linked in the description below this video, you will receive a free PDF detailing how to customize the specific vegan protein powder blends that I personally utilize, including explanations as to why I use these. Now, this is not to say that protein powders are a requirement for building muscle, but for those of you who prefer them for your diet or your lifestyle in some capacity, those blends are the most sound, in my opinion, based on my research. So, moving along, as with all of the foods I've covered thus far in the series, soy also has excellent nutritional properties. Cooked soybeans contain significant amounts of molybdenum, copper, manganese, phosphorus, protein, iron, omega-3 fats, fiber, vitamin B2, magnesium, vitamin K, and potassium. Yep, that's right, omega-3 fats and vitamin K, both of which people think are difficult to obtain as vegans. In fact, one 
Cook, uh, sorry, one cup of cooked soybeans contains 43% of your daily value of omega-3s and 37% of your daily value of vitamin K. Now let's zoom in on the macronutrient profile. One cup of boiled soybeans contains 29 grams of protein with 7 grams of non-fibrous carbs and 15 grams of quality fat with no cholesterol. But perhaps you prefer tofu instead of the beans. Just 3 ounces of tofu can contain 10 grams of protein with only 5 grams of fat and just under 2 grams of non-fibrous carbs. That is incredibly versatile, especially if you are a macro-concerned bodybuilder. Or perhaps maybe you like tempeh, which is fermented soybeans bound in a cake-like form. One cup of tempeh contains 31 grams of protein. Now that said, tempeh is quite a bit higher in both fat and carbs than tofu, so a bit less versatile for the truly macro-obsessed. But that is ultimately relative. I think it is evident the benefits that soy can provide for those looking to optimize their physique and performance However, there are still two more areas of popular concern to address that involve soy, at least on some level, uh, just to make this episode as comprehensive as possible. Some people like to claim that uh, most soy is genetically modified. They try to use this as an argument and effort to denounce soy consumption. Um, and this is arguably an exaggeration. First of all, Organic and certified non-GM soy products do readily exist if you were that concerned about consuming GM. But frankly, I don't worry much over GM myself. Um, I've purchased and consumed both conventional and GM products in my time. I feel there is a serious degree of fear-mongering at play. In fact, GM labeling is a result of consumer demand, not scientific demand. Now, I know I'm going to get some shit for saying this, but GM itself is merely a technology. Like computers or mobile phones and cars, etc. Technology is not inherently bad or good, but it can be used in such a way that could be perceived as bad or good. For example, computers can be used to hack someone's bank account. And cars can be used to run people over. Does this mean that computers and cars are inherently bad? Now, GM is not necessarily synonymous with one company either, like Monsanto. Again, it is a technology that a given company can implement, including Monsanto. In fact, Monsanto doesn't even control the GM market. DuPont has a relatively equal share to Monsanto. And the body of long-term research on GM doesn't demonstrate any significant hazard directly connected with the use and consumption of GM crops. So recall what I said previously about label, uh, labeling being more of a consumer demand and not a scientific concern. I am sure some of you will imply some sort of a conspiracy theory here, but there's a reason it's called a conspiracy theory. A theory lacks the evidence to substantiate claims. I'd rather go by the body of papers, but that's just me. Everyone can do as they wish. If ample, reputable, peer-reviewed research surfaces to demonstrate otherwise, well, I will change my tune. Anyhow, this episode is not about GMO. Uh, but it certainly comes up when soy is mentioned, so I felt I needed to touch on it. Uh, moreover, I will link a laundry list of papers and articles for you to browse in the description regarding uh, various aspects of uh, GM, if you're interested. And remember, if GM truly concerns you, then simply buy organic. It's that simple. Now, moving along, another often argued point when it comes to soy are the Antinutrients, as they're called, like the saponins or uh, goitrogens or trypsin inhibitors and phytates. Uh, I will admit I was once concerned about these as well uh, when I was a relatively new vegan. Uh, first of all, research shows that these so-called antinutrients actually may offer benefits. For instance, phytates have been demonstrated to protect against osteoporosis. Phytates have also been shown to reduce calcification and kidney stone formation, lower blood glucose and lipids, as well as potentially fighting cancer. Nonetheless, anti-nutrient content is reduced or eliminated merely by soaking and sprouting, fermenting, or cooking. Ergo, there's not any reason to really worry about the anti-nutrient content of your soy or other foods. Hell, some soy foods like tempeh and natto are fermented in their preparation. And I imagine most of us cook our foods, except for we're all vegans, and I've made it clear in the past that I do not advocate full raw diets. I advocate a mix of raw and cooked where appropriate. 
So enough is enough with all the fear-mongering aiming to demonize soy. Let's put it to rest and instead make some ethical alpha-fucking gains with soy. Before I go, I also want to bring attention to my friend's channel, The Golden One. A day ago, he announced a shift in his diet, bringing him one step closer to the glorious veganism. While I plan to do a comprehensive video response about this, I wanted to bring awareness to it um, on my channel, uh, uh, you know, ahead of time, so that my viewers can show their support. As you can imagine, a lot of degenerates are disliking this video and trolling. Um, and I will link his video in the description below. Anyhow, drop comments below to let me know what you think of this video about soy, and uh, just please keep it mature. Uh, and please like and share this video to promote this series and spread the education of powerful vegan food choices. Otherwise, I will see you all around in the next episode, my friends.